Good morning, I'm Muriel Otto. I'm your pastoral intern. It's great to see you all this morning. I wanted to tell you this morning about a friend of mine named Dina Strom. Dina is a hospice chaplain in Northwest Washington, so she visits terminally ill patients and talks with them and their families about death and dying. Now, Dina is from the Covenant Church, which is an evangelical denomination, and she used to have really set beliefs about sin and the cross and life and death. But as she's worked for all these years as a, as a hospice chaplain, when you're a hospice chaplain, you meet with all kinds of patients with all kinds of different religious beliefs, including lots of patients who are not religious at all. And so as she's had the honor of working with these patients and talking with them and walking with them through their journey of dying, she's felt her beliefs change a lot. She's felt her theology kind of expand and it's a lot less black and white, there's a lot more shades of gray, it's a lot more flexible and she really likes that. So she, she said that you know, when she sits with these patients, a lot of them, as they're dying, believe that, maybe they believe that there is no life after death, that this world is all there is, and this life is all we get. And she says that as she sits with them and talks with them, she's like, you know, I could be okay with that. I could be okay with the belief that when we die, our bodies go back to the earth and become the soil and the trees and the grass. That's kind of beautiful. Maybe that's what I believe, too. But then last week, one of Dina's best friends lost her seven-year-old daughter to cancer. And Dina said, you know, when I sit with my hospice patients who believe that this life is all there is, I, I think I could believe that, too. But when it happens to me and people I love, when it's that personal, she said, I need heaven. I need there to be more than this life. I need us, I need to believe that we go from life to new life. I need heaven. So that's why I believe in heaven, she said. At least I think that's what I believe. And she just kind of shrugged her shoulders like she's totally okay with not being 100% sure what she believes or what's true, which I think is really cool. So three very different readings today, right? May I borrow your bulletin? Three very different readings. The reading from Acts 9 is a story. Psalm 23 is a poem. The reading from Revelation 7 is a prophecy. Super different readings, but they have one important trait in common. These are all readings that are commonly read at funerals. Okay, but wait. This is the season of Easter, my friends. We're celebrating resurrection and new life. Why would we be reading funeral readings during Easter? Is that totally weird? Or maybe is that totally perfect? In the Acts reading, we hear about a woman who dies and is miraculously brought back to life. Literally lying on her deathbed, someone prays for her, her eyes are open, a hand reaches out and pulls her back up to her feet. She stands, she lives. It's a miracle. Psalm 23. How many of you have heard Psalm 23 before? The Lord has said. How many of you have it memorized? Anybody? A good number. Psalm 23 is one of the oldest and probably like the most beloved poem, maybe ever. It's about how God is with us through every step of our journey, through mountain high moments, through valley low moments, and everything in between. God is with us. God pours out blessings upon us until our cup overflows, and even through death, we live with God forever. And then the Revelation reading, right, looks forward to a time when God is seated on the throne of the world, and people from all over the world 
are gathered worshiping God. It looks forward to a time when all of our trials are over, when there are no tears, no hunger, no thirst, and we drink right from the waters of life. And looks forward to that day. So, time for a hand pull. Which reading would you want at your funeral? Acts, Acts reading where you're raised from the dead. Psalm 23, where you go to live with God forever. Or Revelation, where you make your way to a place where there are no tears, no crying, and no pain. Who wants the Acts reading about Tabitha coming back to life read at their funeral? Who picks that one? Not a single person. Oh, poor Tabitha. As if having your name be Dorcas wasn't enough. Of it. Okay, who wants Psalm 23 read at their funeral? Woo, buddy. All right. Does anybody want the Revelation reading at their funeral? A decent number. A decent number. The thing about these readings is that they force us to ask ourselves, what do we believe? about death and life and life after death. A central, central part of our Christian faith is the belief in everlasting life. That though we might die to this world, we live forever in Jesus. That a Christian is someone who is so alive that they will never, ever, ever stop living. But what does that mean? What does that look like? How do our rational science brains wrap themselves around that? The Bible says very little about heaven and hell. Almost nothing, actually. Jesus, Jesus talks all the time about everlasting life and abundant life and the kingdom of heaven, but he's kind of vague on the details. I hate that about him. So what does everlasting life mean? Does it just mean that we're like really extra alive in this life? Does it mean that when we die, we go to some other place and continue living? Is it maybe not even about us and what happens when we die, but about the whole world and about a day when God will come back and make a new heaven and a new earth where there is no pain and no suffering? Which one is it? I don't know. I don't know. But I know it is important, an important question to ask. Because what you believe about dying determines how you live your life. So think about it. Think about what you believe. What do you believe about life and death and life after death? And how does it affect how you live? I'm not totally sure what I believe. And I definitely don't know what's true. But here's what I do know. I know that there are people in El Salvador living on less than $5 a day. I know Lydia, who makes money walking down into the gorge behind her house each day and hauling up buckets of sand to sell to construction companies to make cement. She lives in a one-room cinder block house there's no floor, there's no running water, there's no electricity. She's hungry all the time. All of her kids know when they hear gunshots to drop to the floor, which happens a lot, because where they live is a hot spot for gang activity. Her oldest son is in jail for being involved in gangs. One of her other sons is living illegally in the States where he sends money back to her. There is very little chance that her life is ever going to change much. She's getting pretty old. And if this, if this life is all she gets, that is not good enough for me. The woman who lives in Brookfield, whose name is Julie, her husband, Mike, of 23 years, a year and a half ago started showing um, memory loss as a result of an accident he was in when he was like a teenager. And so now, just a year and a half later, his memory has deteriorated so much that he can't be left alone anymore. And he gets 
angry and confused, and when he looks at Julie, he only sometimes knows who she is. She had to quit a job that she loves so that she can be his caregiver. His condition is only going to deteriorate, and her caregiving duties are only going to increase. She loves him a lot, but their life is never, ever going to be the same or anything like what they thought it was. Julie's 52. And if this life is all she gets, that is not good enough for me. And I know myself. And I know that even when life is going really, really well, sometimes I get lonely. Or I feel like maybe I don't fit in or I don't belong. Uh, I'm not sure what the point of any of it is, and I feel like I'm not home yet. And maybe that feeling will go away someday, but maybe it won't. Maybe some of you feel like that sometimes, too. So many bold and beautiful promises that God makes to us in the Bible. God says, I will never leave you or forsake you. I will be with you always. I will hear you when you call. God says, I will give power to the weak and strength to the powerless. I will proclaim release for the captives. I will set the prisoners free. God says, I am reconciling all things to myself. I am making all things new. I am working all things together for your good. God says that nothing, nothing, neither death nor life, neither angels nor rulers, neither things present nor things to come, neither powers nor height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will ever separate you from the love of God in Christ. Not even death will ever separate you from the love of God. Some of us, some of us are still waiting for God to make good on some of those promises. This world is still waiting for God to make good on some of those promises. And so, maybe those promises aren't really true. Or maybe the story isn't over. That's why I believe in everlasting life. Because it just seems like Lydia's story, like Julia's story, like my story, like your story, like this world's story, that isn't over yet. God makes all things right in the end. It's not right. It's not the end. But that's just me. So... May you, may you think about what it is that you believe. May you be okay with not being sure. May you know the reality of resurrection in this life and the life to come. When you're knocked down, when you find someone pull you up to your feet. When you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, may you know that God walks with you. When you go through trials, when you find hope in the promise of a day, when pain and tears and hunger is no more, most of all, may you find in the end that nothing, nothing ever separates you from the love of God.